Welcome to Faith and Flower. I'm Robin and this week I have been in the kitchen trying out some recipes to help keep our grocery bill low and to help me use some items I already have in our pantry. I started my search by looking for recipes that were popular back in the Great Depression, so the 1930s here in the United States. Some of the ones I'm going to show you today came from that search and I love how they used very common, easy to find, and inexpensive ingredients to make some really tasty recipes. Most of these are also great pantry meals, meaning that you can store most of the ingredients in your pantry for long periods of time and always have them on hand for an easy meal. I learned many frugal tips from my grandmother who lived through the Great Depression, and one of them was saving baking grease for cooking. It's a great way to use something that would get thrown away, and baking grease, if it is bacon from a really good source, can be a very nutritious fat that you can use in cooking, and I'm saving some right now to make some old-fashioned cornbread. I made this bacon for another recipe I'm gonna show you in a minute, but I need about two tablespoons of bacon grease for the bottom of my skillet, and then I'm gonna place the skillet in the oven to warm up while I put together the rest of the ingredients. This is an old-fashioned Southern cornbread made in a cast iron skillet with buttermilk. It really is a Southern staple. It's very easy and quick, also gluten-free, and is a great side dish for most dinners. For this recipe, you'll need four tablespoons total of vegetable oil or bacon grease. I put two in the skillet, which you saw me put in the oven. It's warming up, and I reserved two to add to the mix. You'll also need two cups of coarse stone ground cornmeal, one teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, one teaspoon of kosher salt, two large eggs, and one and a half cups of buttermilk. Preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I like to put the skillet in there so that it's nice and hot when I'm ready to add the batter. Just add all of the ingredients to a large mixing bowl and then whisk it together until it's nicely combined and add it to your hot skillet. Generally, my family prefers the type of cornbread that is light and fluffy and on the sweet side, but this one is the more traditional type that's a little bit coarser, a little denser, and is not sweet. So I did throw in just a little bit of sugar. I might play around with this recipe to add a little more sweetness, like maybe adding some honey, and I actually really like the coarse texture. But if you are used to sort of a corn muffin, then this will be a little bit different, but I think it's something that you'll really enjoy and it really does make a great accompaniment to any sort of soup recipe. This cornbread is also extremely budget friendly. I can buy a two pound bag of cornmeal at my local grocery store for under two dollars which will allow me to make this recipe many times over. cornbread to go along with a fish chowder that I'm making for dinner tonight. It's actually going to be a clam chowder because I'm omitting the fish from the recipe and I will have all of these recipes linked down in the description box so you can get all of the details. This recipe is called country fish chowder and this is something that was probably much more traditional in the northeastern part of the United States and it was suggested among the recipes that were popular during the Great Depression. Because fish and clams were plentiful in that area, it was something that they could make with readily available ingredients, and this is absolutely delicious. And I made the bacon for this recipe, but I still need a little bit more bacon fat, and so I'm adding that to my pan, and in the meantime, the cornbread was ready. So I pulled that out of the oven. It looks and smells delicious, and I'm so excited to try it along with this soup. The ingredients are one cup of chopped onion, four bacon strips chopped, three cans of evaporated milk, one can of whole kernel corn, one can of chopped clams, three medium potatoes peeled and cubed, three tablespoons of butter, 
a teaspoon of salt, three quarter teaspoons of pepper, and a pound of fish fillets. They suggest haddock, cod, or flounder cooked and broken into pieces. So I did not use the fish and instead I used three cans of clams. And you'll see I made the mistake of draining my clams and so the next time I make it I'll make sure not to do that so that that fish stock is added to the soup as well. I did things a little bit differently than the original recipe because I wanted to render the fat from the bacon for the cornbread. According to the recipe, you need to cook the onion and bacon together over medium heat until the bacon is crisp and drained. And so that's why I added a little bit of extra bacon grease to my pan. Then you add milk, corn, clams, the potatoes, butter, salt, and pepper. You just cover and cook over medium heat, stirring occasionally until the potatoes are tender, and then only takes about 20 minutes. We all love New England style clam chowder, and it's not something that I think about making very often, but now that I've tried this recipe, I will definitely do it again. It was a big hit here, and I think I'd like to try it using the original recipe. Adding the fish, I think, would be delicious. I also love that most of the ingredients are shelf staple pantry items, so canned items and produce like Potatoes that will store in your pantry for a long period of time are great to have on hand. Um, I do have a prepper pantry or basically just an extended food storage area in our home so that I can have food on hand. And of course, I want it to be food that we are going to actually eat. And so these sorts of ingredients are great to have on hand. And it's really nice to have recipes that use them so that we can eat what we store. If you've been looking for good pantry meals, this one is a good one to add to your collection. And if you wanna know more about our Prepper Pantry, I have a whole playlist on that, so I will have it linked down in the description box so that you can watch those videos. This soup turned out so creamy and delicious. My family loved it and the cornbread was the perfect side. Next recipe is for navy bean and ham soup. And again, this one was suggested many times as a popular recipe from the Great Depression. I found many variations of this recipe, but this one was the simplest and was surprisingly my family's favorite of all of these recipes that I am gonna be showing you today. There are just four ingredients for this recipe. You'll need one 16 ounce bag of dry navy beans, that's two cups, one large onion, a pound of diced ham, and some green onion for garnish, which is optional. I just add the onion and the ham to the pan and cook it together while the onions soften. Usually I would use ham that I have in my freezer left over from a spiral ham or something like that along with a bone to give the soup lots of extra flavor. And I like to cook my navy beans or really any dry beans in the instant pot first. They come out nice and tender that way and really speed up the cooking time. If you don't have an instant pot in the original recipe, which I have linked down in the description box, there will be instructions on how to soak the beans. The other alternative to speed up the cooking time is to use some canned navy beans. They will be ready to go in your recipe. You will not have to do any additional soaking, but I do recommend in order to keep the cost down to go for the dry beans. They really are so economical. The ham gives so much flavor to the recipe. All you really have to add is six cups of water, but I did add a little bit of chicken broth just to bump up the flavor of it. 
I found dried navy beans at my local grocery store for just $1.17 and the diced ham was $4.03. This recipe makes eight large servings and so the price per serving is under a dollar. By pre-cooking the beans in my Instant Pot, I really cut down on the cook time. I let it simmer on the stove covered for about 20 minutes just to bring the flavors together and then it was ready to serve. I topped it with some green onions and then we seasoned it with a little salt and pepper to taste. Of course, you can add any other dry spices that you think you might like in this soup to change the flavor a little bit, but this basic recipe was so delicious and as I said, it really was one of my family's favorites and I know I'm going to be making it again soon. Pantry meals during the winter time are wonderful, but it's really nice to supplement that with some fresh fruit that's in season like citrus. And I like to make a variation of an orange salad to brighten things up and give my family some extra vitamin C during this cold and flu season. Because oranges are in season, I can get a pretty good price at my local grocery store. Right now an eight pound bag is around $7, so it's still fairly economical. I got this idea from my mother-in-law. She makes hers with raisins and dried fig, I believe. You can change up whatever you want to add to the oranges or you can just serve them as they are. I usually make a very simple vinaigrette to go along with it. And this time I am going to add some pomegranate. At about $3 each at my local grocery store, they're not the least expensive fruit, but they are packed with antioxidants and they add a really great crunch and flavor to the salad. And I'm going to show you how you can get the little pomegranate seeds out without making a tremendous mess. This was something that I struggled with for a long time. And once I discovered how to do this, it became quick and easy with the exception of getting it started. You'll see some juice coming out. Sometimes I have a little bit better luck cutting them without releasing any juice, but after I get them underwater, I can quickly get all of the little seeds out and most of the pith, the white part, will rise to the surface and so it's very easy to get them out and much less expensive than buying them already seeded. Don't you just love all of that color? <laughs> I promise it tastes as good as it looks. And to make the vinaigrette, I just mix up a little bit of olive oil, some apple cider vinegar, and a little salt, and that's it. There's enough sweetness from the orange and the pomegranate. So once I whisk those things together, I just pour it right on, and that is it. beef on toast is one of those classic recipes from the Great Depression. Most of you have probably heard about it before, but it's also a great pantry meal and so I wanted to give it a try with my family. This was something that I grew up having occasionally and I always really enjoyed it. So I thought my family would too. And dried beef is something that you can easily keep in your pantry. You can have it on hand for a quick meal. It's also a fairly inexpensive ingredient at my local grocery store. I found a jar like this for just $3.68. In addition to the dried beef, you'll need four tablespoons of butter, a quarter cup of flour, and I just substituted a gluten-free flour, two cups of milk, 
some pepper to taste, and of course, some toasted bread. Start by melting the butter in a large skillet and then add the chopped beef. Cook that for about three minutes while your bread is toasting. At that point, you should add the flour to the beef and stir well and allow to cook for an additional three minutes. I forgot and added my milk first, but it still worked out, especially I think because I was using a gluten-free flour which dissolved easily into the milk. I would suggest if you're using regular all-purpose flour that you add it to the beef and allow it to cook a little bit. It will reduce that sort of floury taste and will also help it dissolve into the milk better. So follow the instructions. I'll have them down in the description box. As you stir, the mixture will thicken. So just continue to cook and stir for about five minutes. And once it does start to really thicken, you can add pepper to taste if you want it to be a little bit spicier. And I like to add a little bit of nutmeg. The sauce that you're making is basically a bechamel and I always think nutmeg goes great in that. gravy all over top of your toast and that's it. It's a super simple light dinner, would make a really easy lunch as well. My family really enjoyed it and I served it alongside of the orange salad which really rounded it out. This week I also had a recipe failure. This was my bread machine sourdough loaf and I will insert a picture of what it should look like. It turned out to be about a third of the size so it did not rise for whatever reason and this sort of thing does happen especially with something finicky like a sourdough. But instead of tossing it out, I wanted to be frugal and figure out a way that we could enjoy this and not waste it. I had the idea to turn it into a French toast bake, sort of like a bread pudding. So I just started cutting it up into cubes. And in hindsight, I think it would have been better if I had made smaller cubes, but <laughs> this was an experiment. So I learned a few things along the way. Then I just whisked together eight eggs. Um, I didn't even measure, but I'd say about a cup of milk, maybe a little more. You wanna make sure that the liquid covers the bread. And I added a dash of vanilla and about a quarter cup of sugar.
let it sit in the refrigerator overnight, and the next morning I baked it at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour. It was actually pretty good. It wasn't as good as if I had some nice fluffy bread in this recipe, but it was a great way to save my failure and not waste anything. This last recipe is for peanut butter granola bars. Now this is not something that came out of the Great Depression, but it did come out of my desire to save money and create a healthy snack. So I've been noticing that prices for ready-made granola bars and things like that, especially the gluten-free variety, have really been going up. And that's something that Peyton enjoys taking in his lunch. So I wanted to discover something that I could do myself. I could control the ingredients, control the price, and still give him a delicious snack to take along each day. This recipe uses just five ingredients and they're all things that I always have in my pantry. Mix together three cups of old-fashioned rolled oats and I use the gluten-free that I find at Trader Joe's, three quarter cups of peanut butter, one third cup of maple syrup, you can also substitute honey, a half a cup of mini chocolate chips, and two whole eggs. This is a really good basic recipe and I think it would be even better by adding a few things like walnuts, pecans, almonds, chia seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, or even dried fruit. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and after all of the ingredients are well combined, spread them out on a baking dish that has been lined with parchment paper. Bake for 15 to 17 minutes or until the center is baked through and the edges are just starting to brown. It's important to let the bars cool completely before cutting them into squares or bars with a sharp knife. saved a few for us to enjoy now and I packaged up the rest with a little bit of kitchen twine and some wax paper sandwich bags that I found at my local grocery store so that Peyton would have some snacks available to take each day. These store great in the freezer and I just keep them there and pull one out to add to his lunch every day. so much for spending your time with me here today. I hope that you were able to pick up a couple of new recipes, some ideas for keeping things frugal in your kitchen. If you like videos like this, let me know down in the comment section so I'll know to make more and be sure to give me a thumbs up. I also want to invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you join us here at Faith and Flower. I make new videos each week and I'll be back next Sunday, two o'clock central time. So join me then and until then, have a wonderful week.